thank you very much, Simon and, and Mattia, for organising today. Um, um, I'm going to present um, on this on my project that I've been doing uh, for sa safety netting and quality um, improvement in radiology um, in the southwest. Um, so, questions. If you put questions out um, throughout the um, uh, throughout the talk, but I'll try and go through them at the end and answer anything that uh, is unclear. Um, now, I know that we've got a mixed audience today, um, so hopefully there'll be something for everyone. Um, but I am going to focus a little bit on some of the more technical issues. Um, so um, we're going to discuss some of the internal in, uh, in process improvements that I've uh, implemented using Python within uh, the Southwest. Um, we, we're doing this using open source software um, because it, it it's the best tool for the job in this case. Um, and I'm going to present some of the, the software that we're using, some of the useful tools and libraries that we found, um, as well as going through some of the challenges and risks. Um, and there will be a shameless plug because we are hoping to recruit. So if anyone knows of any candidates or any good uh, recruitment channels, um, then um, I'm, this is really a, a showcase of the work that I've been doing. Um, and um, uh, 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 we're looking for people to get involved as well. OK, so traditional methods as a as a junior doctor, when you're going through the kind of quality improvement process, uh, data collection can be incredibly labor intensive, very repetitive and boring. And of course, prone to error, as anything is, um, methodology is quite hard to change and improve once you've started. It can take just as long again to repeat the audit um, with a slightly different methodology if you think of an improvement halfway through. We're lucky in radiology in that we um, have a fairly mature um, relational database um, of all our clinical data. And actually, um, almost all radiology um, metadata is available within um, this relational database um, for audits and quality improvement purposes. Um, and complex data based queries can significantly reduce the amount of manual time that's required to uh, prevent things happening that shouldn't happen. Um, so it's a great um, uh, aid to effective quality improvement. Checking compliance with a gold standard can be incredibly time consuming. A manual check against trust policy, uh, national guidelines, any, anyone who's undertaken a clinical audit will be familiar that this, this isn't straightforward and anything that involves pulling the notes um, takes a very long time. So uh, having information av available digitally is, is a huge benefit. Um, and because of, of, of manual audit and how, how much labour is involved, a small random sample is often all you can do to prove or disprove that you're doing what you should be doing. Um, and if, if you've audited a random sample, there's, you, there's a, a quite a high chance that there will be some cases kicking around that don't meet your criteria and you will have missed them because you have only looked at a small random sample. Um, auditing twice as many cases takes twice as long um, and data collection for audit and then uh, repeat cycles for quality improvement uh, are very time consuming because you have to manually look through each case. Um, we, we kind of taken an approach in the southwest that regular tests um, on our database to ensure that we're complying with trust policy can prevent um, things that shouldn't happen um, from happening, or at least pick them up afterwards uh, at an early point when they can be corrected and addressed. Um, and I'll run through a few specific examples of, of what we've kind of done um, with this. Um, but uh, that, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about them more in, the, in a minute, but any uh, clinical staff there that have um, had a junior registrar report one of their scans and then been waiting for a consultant to have a look at it, um, previously, that was kind of a manual process, and now we we, we have um, some safety nets in place that are, are written and, and built using Python, um, as well as a, a few well-known open source libraries in order to prevent um, or pick up cases that deviate from, from our kind of trust policy. Uh, we also use it to ensure um, legal compliance with radiation protection legislation, replacing a previously quite arduous manual process that required um, looking through an Excel spreadsheet, I'm sure people are familiar with these sorts of processes in their own departments. Um, the, the safety nets provide ongoing regular and timely feedback on non-compliant exams, 
the majority of these run every morning um, and uh, feedback to the appropriate member of staff where possible. Sometimes we do have um, a secretary who has to kind of filter things through, uh, but I try to kind of um, get the information um, immediately to the person who needs it. So this is um, a, a quick example of what um, one of our reports looks like when we um, have had it reported by one of our overnight registrars. Sometimes they're quite junior, uh, they're learning. Um, it's an invaluable opportunity for them to learn overnight. Um, but nonetheless, the consultant checks it in the morning and looks at the looks at the scan and then issues an addendum. Um, in our initial audit, um, which I wrote um, as an SQL search, which looked at our um, our uh, database, we found that approximately 1.8% of work was with this code on was going unchecked, which was obviously not ideal, um, but it was an opportunity for improvement. Um, so uh, the, the Python based stack that will I'll go through the technical details in a minute um, that I've implemented um, will flags flags unchecked reports up to um, uh, the secretarial staff at lunchtime and they're able to kind of go back to the person who should have checked it and said you've missed one um, uh, would you be able to look look at it uh, so it's kind of um, safety net and and make sure that um, that the sort of high risk cases that have been reported by tired members of staff overnight who are quite junior uh, gets picked up and and hopefully we don't miss any of those um I've also put in place some some safety nets for cancer. Um, so specifically, if um, someone uh, has a chest X-ray, which is quite concerning for cancer, but hasn't been confirmed, usually are, and, and I'm sure Mark will tell you a bit more because this this kind of has some crossover with Mark's excellent work up in Gloucester, uh, Gloucestershire. Um, but basically, patients who've, who've got a chest X-ray that looks pretty suspicious will need a CT. Um, and um, you kind of recommend a CT in the report and almost always that gets picked up by the person who asked for the chest x-ray in the first place um, and they, they request a CT and a CT happens. But there's no safety net um, in place if, if that initial report gets overlooked. Um, so we, we are working currently on improving our lung cancer pathways so that if um, one of the thoracic radiologists has reported a chest x-ray of concern uh, we um, we don't stop following them up until um, we know that they've had a CT and everything's okay. Similarly, if um, one of our reports suggests that patient needs to go to the MDT, um, I've also put in some safety nets to make sure that that happens. Um, and then this is the sort of medical physics um, and radiation protection side of things. We do have trust policies um, that suggest that some um, uh, plain films can be looked at by the referrer and don't need to be reported formally by a radiologist, but those are very tightly defined criteria based on uh, the referrer's areas of expertise. Um, so I put in place some, some safety nets to basically make sure that, that no errors happen there, uh, because despite uh, monthly audit, they were slipping through the net and they were only getting picked up 30 days uh, potentially after they'd slipped through the net, whereas actually using uh, open source based safety nets, um, you can you can kind of get get the uh, cases that deviate on a daily basis and correct them as in a in a timely manner. Um, and it's significantly less labor intensive. So this this has gone down very well with our radiographers. Um, uh, we've also used Python for performance analysis. Our trainees um, uh, have targets to achieve, as everyone does. Um, it's very easy to fall behind. So as a kind of illustration of, of the sort of targets, our senior trainees have to report four and a half thousand plane films in a year. Um, so that's not insignificant. That's a lot um, that you have to keep going and you have to keep at it. Um, and if you don't know what your current um, uh, number is, how are you going to achieve your final um, significant uh, target? Actually, it's a lot easier if you have it broken down week by week and you know um, how you're doing and whether you need to up your game, um, as we'll see in a minute. Um, this also had a significant impact on um, the, the fact that people didn't really know where they were in terms of how far through their target they were. And it meant that towards the end of the year, people got panicked um, and basically that uh, they did a lot of reporting towards the deadline. So there was a bit of an impact on service because 
it was really um, uh, hard to find plain films to report. Basically, everything got reported before the deadline, uh, but not much happened kind of towards the start of the year. And the other thing is everyone had a slightly different technique that they'd use to count their numbers um, because there is some kind of there are there were some choices that you had to make. So there was no standardized search methodology in place. Um, another thing that, that the as we'll see in a minute, the Python based tools have allowed us to do is pick up our um, addenda. So if I report a, a CT and someone else has a look at it and uh, agrees with what I've said or um, has noticed something else that I maybe not haven't appreciated because I've overlooked it. Um, they will add an addendum, which um, is their kind of opinion basically on that particular examination. Previously, these were just um, getting issued to the clinician so that the referrer could see exactly what the new opinion was. But that primary reporter was missing out on the learning opportunity to see the follow up. Um, someone else has looked at their exam and they've either agreed or they've added some. So we were missing out on the ability to see what um, what additional findings have been found by someone else. Um, so uh, for our registrars, we've put together this regional uh, performance uh, information kind of uh, uh, weekly email. Uh, that details um, how they're doing and it's inspired by a cricket graph. So if they're lagging behind on their targets and they need to hit a few sixes, they can see how they're doing um, compared to um, kind of the average, what they should be doing in order to achieve their end of year target. So the idea is that it kind of, they know exactly where they are and what they need to do. Um, it goes out on a Monday, so they're kind of motivated for the week and they're set up. There's no deviation from kind of the set methodology. So people know that they're competing on a level playing field and that their search methodology is exactly the same as their colleagues. Um, and they get a list of any of their reports that they've reported that someone else has had a look at um, and added information to. Um, so if um, they've reported something um, and a, a consultant has looked at it or um, someone else has looked at it and added an additional opinion. They're able to go back into those and see what additional findings or indeed whether it's agreement. But either way, they're able to see that second opinion. So um, that's that's kind of a high level overview of some of the safety nets and performance improvements that I've I've carried out recently. I have done a few more bits and pieces than that, but those are kind of uh, that's that sort of sort of taster. And now um, we move on to some of the technical things. So this is um, a PyCon forum. Obviously, we want to talk about Python um, because that's what we're here for. Um, so uh, I'm going to I'm going to run through um, uh, sort of a, a few of the technical bits. So the inspiration for these tools, um, the initial search was developed because basically um, our consultant um, one morning consultants had a meeting and they completely forgot to do all the checking. Um, so that was obviously a, a massive failure, but it was also an opportunity for improvement. And that initial safety check um, for the overnight unchecked work was put into place following that. Um, we work closely with information governance. Um, we worked with our radiology system provider to obtain a read only database connection. Um, and then I did some reading. Um, anyone who wants to learn SQL, um, uh, SQL Zoo is very good. Um, and there's uh, um, some good books and resources here. So Python for data analysis. I'm sure that many of you guys are already very familiar with that book. It's it's um, it's been written by the uh, Wes McKinney, who um, uh, is responsible for the pandas library um, so i'd highly recommend that so the platform that we're using for these quality improvement um, uh, safety netting uh, checks is we have several ubuntu virtual machines um, i've always used debian um, and ubuntu is very nice as well so um, that was what our um, local it team they had images available of, uh, for ubuntu so i was quite happy to use that um, and then uh, we we have a I've got a full open source stack which I'm quite careful about. Um, we'll discuss some of the risks of of indiscriminate library use in a minute. Um, but we use Python, uh, Pandas, SQL Alchemy um, uh, with with a, a, a Postgres database connector, uh, Matplotlib for the graphs, um, and Postgres. Um, I've actually got my own Postgres instance on the virtual machines as well. Um, output for all of this quality, um, the, the safety net scripts is via an SMTP enabled NHS dot 
net mail account and we'll have a chat about that in a minute as well so first of all um, we've detailed the stack that we're using um, now i would say that all code is is a potential liability obviously you want to keep your liabilities low and only use um, uh, libraries when they really add something to the project and that you've got good oversight of them and i would suggest that not um, all open source projects are equal. Um, so my uh, um, uh, advice is stick to well-maintained and widely used libraries. And if you're unsure, have a look at the GitHub page to see how many commits have been done recently, releases, when releases have been uh, performed. If you've got any kind of overview on previous security vulnerabilities and how well they've been addressed and whether they've been addressed in an open manner, that applies to both um, open source, but also proprietary tools. I think sometimes security vulnerabilities aren't really addressed in an open manner, uh, more so actually in uh, in, in, in closed source. Um, but the, the long and the short of it is supply chain security is, is very hard. Um, you, you might have this assumption with open source that others have reviewed the code, um, but everyone's assuming the same thing and you know what they say about assumptions. So there is no panacea, but NHS Digital are doing considerable work on security and open source security at the moment. This has been led, I believe, by Dr. Johnny Pearson at NHS X, um, and he sent out um, this morning to me um, these links uh, which detail uh, latest policy on, um, on NHS um, open source software uh, security issues. And these this, this is work in progress. Uh, but it's very important work in progress and I'm, I'm very grateful to, to Johnny for his, his time and effort on this. So the platform that we're using, um, we've got three VMs, virtual machines that are uh, locally hosted, um, so they're internal, they're not um, on Azure or anything like that. Um, one of them's development, one of them's production and one of them's for image storage. Um, I'm um, trying to use Ansible for platform management to make sure that everything's consistent across the board um, and to allow scaling up if required. Um, and then email output. So um, all of all of the quality improvement scripts that I, I have written use very similar but not the same um, email templates. And Ginger, if anyone's come across this library before, it's quite widely used. Um, uh, I came across it when using Flask. Uh, but Ginger is a mature templating library that can be used for HTML email templates. Um, and basically, the, the, the killer feature of Ginger is that it allows uh, templated HTML output, but the templates can inherit from each other. Um, so this really helps keep your code um, very um, uh, it, it, it improves maintainability. What I would say is that I found um, NHS.net um, email to be quite unreliable. Uh, SMTP can be down sometimes. Uh, the TLS um, uh, connections, um, uh, sometimes the certificates are, are, are kind of ad hoc, like OK on some connections and not on others. Um, you just have to assume that everything isn't um, as reliable as it should be um, and just plan for error. Um, and that makes everything a bit stronger. Um, uh, so um, I would mention that if anyone's considering um, uh, sending emails via NHS.net. Um, I've taken a very conservative approach to sending emails, be, um, and I would, would um, uh, very limited um, information is sent out, just what is needed to do the job and certainly nothing that would be able to identify a patient. Um, uh, uh, no, no kind of uh, dates of births or, or names. Um, and although NHS.net is routinely used for information exchange, taking a conservative approach is required. Um, I, one of the other risks with using email is that you have someone's email address um, and they move out of the area or they move to a different trust. And we'll discuss that in a minute. Um, there's also, we've, we've discussed NHS.net SMTP uh, that, that, that can be a bit problematic from time to time. Um, one thing that I really think um, would be beneficial in the long run, and I kind of mentioned this in case anyone sort of thinking about um, open source kind of uh, opportunities that, that would be beneficial across the NHS, it would be lovely to see an, a Python module that you can import um, and maybe add some uh, authentication information um, and then be able to get access to the NHS directory 
um, so that you can see um, which members of staff are registered at which trusts, because at the moment it's difficult to kind of, you, you might have added an email address to your application, but you've got no way of confirming that that member of staff with that email address hasn't been mistyped and does actually work at the place that you think they work at. Um, and that would provide additional reassurance that you're not sending emails to the wrong location and the wrong um, uh, the wrong employee, um, which is a risk when you're sending out emails automatically. Unfortunately, LDAP access for NHS.net was once upon a time available, but I believe that's been removed. And I think that was because it was un um, previously um, unauthenticated. So another risk um, with our applications um, and um, actually if anyone's thinking of developing um, software using open source um, in, in the NHS, I mentioned these tools because I found them very useful. Um, so pre-commit is, is excellent for running checks before you um, version control any of your code. Um, and this basically just assures that everything passes um, uh, linting and code quality checks. Um, so I'm using Flake 8, iSort, um, uh, yet another Python formatter, and SQL fluff to ensure consistency and readability um, in all the code that, that um, I've committed for these quality assurance checks. Um, th there is still progress that I can make in this area. I think tests, um, automated testing, um, uh, could be improved in, in my project. Um, and then assessment of code coverage and continuous integration. Those are all things that I would like to work on in due course. So information governance is a, bit of, is, is a, is a risk and it's very important to uh, seek advice from people that um, have more expertise on you if you're unsure. Um, uh, the, the safety nets that I've been carrying out have been cross-site projects um, in Plymouth and RCHT. Um, now, I've been navigating um, some of the issues by um, making sure that I involve um, high level decision makers before um, implementing a particular improvement. Um, I've signed contracts of employment um, for both sites. So I'm actually an employee um, at both sites that I, um, I help out um, with the quality improvement. Um, and I'm always very keen to get review from a, a team member information governance professional with a different viewpoint to my own. Um, but going forward, I think actually uh, if en every individual um, has to sign a, an honorary contract for, um, uh, for the particular trust where they're doing data analysis, I think it doesn't scale very well. So we're currently in investigating whether we can um, trial a regional information sharing agreement for quality improvement and research purposes. Um, one of the other risks that I've I've come across, um, and this is something that, that's that's very worth considering, um, both um, I know we've got lots of people from NHS Digital here, and um, I'd be grateful to hear your opinion on these issues. But um, I've noticed that throughout the NHS, um, it's really difficult to get access to the proper tools to do the job. Um, and for this reason, spreadsheets are in widespread use um, when relational databases would be far more appropriate. And we've got Excel spreadsheets kicking around with all sorts of things that should be in databases. And when you ask for a database, your request gets declined. So that's 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 a big barrier. Um, and kind of connected to this, there's there's a lot of places I'd like to have a single point of reference um, when I'm when I'm looking at uh, uh, you know members of staff's email addresses or um, uh, uh, whether someone works in radiology, what grade they are, that sort of thing. It's difficult to get single points of reference where there's a defined API where there is just one um, version of the truth. Um, there seems to be lots of versions of the truth around the trust, all kept in Excel spreadsheets, unfortunately. So um, the so far, I find that um, these projects have resulted in improved compliance across the board and not just on a random sample, because previously we were doing audit on, say, 50 cases that have happened in the last three months. Now we're able to say we've looked, we've run tests on all of our cases and they comply. Um, and so rule, rules based searches can offer easier gains than AI. 
Uh, although I appreciate sometimes these rules might be creatively labelled as AI, um, technically they're not. Writing code is a lot more fun than pulling notes. Um, this is a specific one for any clinical uh, staff looking um, to try and make um, small improvements in their particular area of practice. Um, and once you've written the code once, it's easy to do ongoing re-audit. And after you've got the net payback, ongoing productivity improvements are free. Um, and in addition, you build your local expertise, your knowledge. You've got lots of transferable skills. You may have failed on a few of these, these things, um, but you, if you've learned, then it's not a complete waste of time. Um, and it's um, a, a lot of the skills gained are highly applicable to other domains. I, I noticed we've got Harris here. Um, um, uh, I, I, it's, it's, I'm sure, no news to him that, um, that uh, a lot of these skills are very applicable to research as well as CCIO roles. So we've discussed some of the risks. Um, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I think I'm just going to move on to um, uh, key sort of take, takeaway messages. Uh, try and find inspiration from daily frustrations um, and use these to drive innovation. Any mistake is a potential opportunity. Uh, just remember that next time you're getting frustrated by something that's really uh, gone not as well as it could have done. The data system is a gold mine. Take small incremental steps, test at each stage, reverse any failures as fast as you can, um, and then um, just try and get some feedback so that you can uh, make improvements. Always seek advice from information governance when you're unsure. We've got a thorough and supportive team at UHP, and we're very lucky in that respect. So where we're going in the future, um, this is a plug. Um, we, we, we're looking to recruit. Um, so if anyone, um, we, we're, we've got some funding for a band seven um, uh, uh, data scientist, and, and we're, 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 we're very open to, um, to trying to build the team. Um, so I will be if you if you're interested in that, either email me or look out on the PyCom um, group. Um, we're we're also trying to make sure that that we're well funded so that we can um, progress forward our objectives and build what we've achieved so far, build on what we've achieved so far. And um, in order to scale, um, we're currently investigating a formal regional information sharing agreement uh, for quality improvement and research purposes. So um, I've given a, a few Python uh, kind of high level overview technically. Um, and if anyone's got any further questions or is interested in finding out more about um, working with us at UHP, uh, then that's my email address.